Hello, I'm Svetlin Naku from the Software University, SoftUni. Today, together with my colleagues George Gurgiev, we continue teaching this free Java Foundations course and the basic concepts from Java programming, such as arrays, lists, methods, strings, classes, objects, and exceptions, to prepare you for the Java Foundations official exam from Oracle. In this lesson, your instructor George will explain and demonstrate how to use methods in Java. Methods allow developers to declare subprograms in their classes and in their programs. Declaring a method means to give a name for a certain block of commands and involve these commands later by their name. Methods can accept parameters, input data, and return a result, output data. This is the reason why they are sometimes called functions, like in math. Your instructor George will explain how methods work through live coding examples and will give you some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience. Are you ready? Let's start worrying. Before we dive into the course, I want to show you the SoftUni JIT system, where you can get instant feedback for your exercise solutions. SoftUni JIT is an automated system for code evaluation. You just send your code for a certain coding problem and the system will tell you whether your solution is correct or not and what exactly is missing or wrong. I'm sure you will love the judge system once you start using it. Let me show you how you can submit the solutions from your hands-on practical exercises to the automated grading system, the so-called soft unit judge. So you have a judging system designed to send you your code and it tells you whether the code is correct or not. And I will show you how it works. You open this link and you go on this, uh, on this uh, website where is in the software judge and you click, click practice and you have this full Java Full Foundation course. These are the, the problems and here you, you put your code just like it's shown here and you submit and you send it so for example let's the first problem student information is this one and this is your solution in java and you want to check whether your solution is correct or not you click submit and it appears here so you can refresh in few moments and it tells you whether your code is correct or not if you put some incorrect code for example uh, I will format incorrectly the age and the grades of, 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 the, uh, of the output. And when I click here, it tells me that I have all the tests wrong. And in this case, I can click the details and I can see that it, the expected input is like this. Uh, the, and my output is this one at, at the right. I have one additional digit which is which should not be there. So this is how the judge system works. It will be your best friend when you are learning uh, Java through our training courses because uh, as I repeat many times, uh, learning Java is mostly coding and let's watching videos so you need to practice that's why we have prepared a lot of coding exercises for you and please do them because i want you to become java developers before the start i would like to introduce your course instructors svetlin nakov and george gurgiev who are experienced java developers senior software engineers and inspirational tech trainers they have spent thousands of hours teaching programming and software technologies and are top trainers from SoftUni. I'm sure you will like how they teach programming. Hello everyone, this is George and today we'll, we will be talking about methods, meaning that we will find a few ways in which we can make our code more organized and a few ways in which we can uh, extend its functionality. But keep in mind that everything we uh, learn from here on out after we know how to uh, create loops, branching of our code and allocating dynamic memory. Everything else we do is just uh, a tool which helps us write more efficient code or a tool which helps us uh, write shorter code or m better formatted code and so on. Because everything up to this point has covered all of the 
main functionality a program needs so you could so you can write any type of software with it now that doesn't mean that it's practical to write software with only the knowledge of arrays uh, for loops and ifs and conditional statements but uh, it is possible to write any program with that knowledge up to now so learning about methods now this is just something which allows us to build upon the knowledge we already have and gives us a lot of powerful tools to organize our code and to reuse it and so on but it's not uh, essential in creating any other program so anything you can do with a method you can do without a method but it really helps and no one really writes uh, business level software without implementing methods and a whole lot of other stuff we're going to uh, continue learning in the following lessons. So, to the topic at hand, methods. What are they? Why are they used? So, what are we going to cover today? We'll cover what a method is and why we need to use them, how we can name them and how, what are the best practices in naming them and we'll cover this last in the lecture even though it's uh, uh, further ahead, uh, even though it's uh, soon in the slides and it's in the first slides it's in the first slides because when you're uh, reviewing your le lecture later on you will need to uh, pay more attention to this uh, topic than the other topics we have covered during uh, the lesson so uh, we'll talk about how we can uh, declare and invoke methods meaning that we how we can create named pieces of code which can be later reused from other pieces of code how we can return values from those how we can pass in parameters to them we'll talk about uh, a concept of the concept of values and value and reference types and we'll just dive into a bit of that and how it uh, functions in programming and how we can uh, handle it and what we should uh, uh, be watchful for when working with this type uh, the, this difference in um, data types and then we'll talk about how we can overload methods meaning have the same method which accepts different different parameters and then we'll talk about how a program is structured in uh, in Java and how execution happens and what is the so-called program stack and why the debugger has uh, a frames window which shows that program stack how it's useful uh, how it affects our execution the execution of our program and so on so before we talk about what methods are let's see a piece of code and think about how we can uh, optimize it so first let's write a very simple program our program will just print some stuff on the console but it will print it in sort of a prettified way so what i'll do is i'll do a system.out.println and i'll print a bunch of symbols let what which symbol do you want well let's say we'll use dashes Okay, so we're printing, okay, let's not, let's pick something different than dashes. Dashes are too standard. Let's use, 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 what should we use? Okay, let's use dollars because everyone loves those. Well, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people do. So, printing dollars. So, we'll print dollars and then between those dollars, we'll print out a line that says hello or uh, this is your receipt or um, welcome to methods. Okay, so... If I start this program, what is, uh, what's going to occur is that I'll get three lines outputted on the console and they will contain the dollars I printed out as well as my message and the dollars to finish that up. Okay, so what can we do? What don't we like about this code? Well, we obviously like the dollar part, but we don't exactly like it 100% uh, from a programmer point of view. Well, what, what's, not, uh, what's not okay in this code? Well, a few things. First off, what happens if uh, my requirements change and uh, it turns out that I shouldn't be printing dollars, but I should be printing stars? Well, I need to replace the stars over here and then the dollars over here I need to replace with stars. And then I need to go and replace the dollars at the other place with stars again. So I need to replace at two spots. So I have some piece of code and then I need to replace that piece of code at two places and both of those could, could uh, cause an error because if I miss replacing something correctly or if I do replace it but I miss one of uh, the stars I need to add, well that will generate an error. 
Now, you already know how you handle stuff like that. If a value repeats itself, you should probably extract a variable for it. So you should uh, extract a variable called, let's say, um, header or symbols or whatever, and initialize that to this uh, sequence of symbols. And in that case, you'd only need to replace in one position shot. So you'd only need to replace uh, the value which gets assigned to header. And after doing that, that will be printed equally in, in both places. But still, we're, we're still, we still have, still have an issue here. What the issue is, is that we're repeating code. What do I mean by repeating code? Well, we're repeating the fact that we're printing on the console and we're printing a certain value on the console. Again, this is a really simplified example. So it's not a big, it's not really a big repetition of code, but the point still stands. We're repeating, uh, execution which could be generalized and another thing about repeating execution it's not just about the fact that there's repeated code but that once you have repeated execution of something that means that there's a business concept or just a concept in your program of that thing being executed so this is this is a named thing this is a header being printed this is a line of symbols being printed if you're repeating something that's that thing probably needs a name that thing is uh, some type of cornerstone into your code which you need to uh, consider as a first class citizen of your code like variables have names and they're first class citizens of your code so here you have pieces of code which repeat themselves so you probably have some underlying concept in your program which needs to um, be generalized and, and have a name w by which you refer to it instead of writing that piece of code everywhere. So what we can use in programming uh, to replace repetitive code. So if we're repeating a value, we use a variable to, re to repeat that value and to store it into a single variable and from there on out, we repeat the variable. Now, if we see that we're repeating code, especially if it's more code than just two lines like here, so if it's more code, if it's a sequence of uh, operations, for example, um, in the lesson for arrays, we had to read uh, an array of numbers from a line on the console. Well, that's a very good example of a piece of code which you'll probably need to repeat a lot of times. So we'll, we'll uh, need to refactor that in some way we need to edit that code in some way so it can represent the concept in our program which it deserves to represent so how do we do that well we use methods what are methods methods are just named pieces of code that's it nothing more complicated than that like the way your code stands in a main body so this is the main method this is a method, main is a method in Java, and it is the entry point of your program, and your program just contains a bunch of code. And that bunch of code is located inside this main identifier. So methods are just named pieces of code, that's it. Though they're nothing uh, fantastic or special or uh, nothing hard to understand. They're just ways for you to get a few lines of code give them a name and be able to invoke those lines of code with that name instead of uh, having to use, uh, having to copy that code over and over again. So let's make a method and let's call it with an appropriate name for what it's going to be doing. Now, what are we doing over here? Well, we're pretty much printing a sequence of characters. We're printing a line of characters. We have a line of some type of character and that we're printing that on the console. Okay, so instead of writing this out every time, let's just say we, that we have a method which does that. Now, methods, you can declare this in the same place where the main method is declared. So the main method is declared over here inside the class main, inside these two, these, this opening and this closing bracket. And you can declare, de define a method anywhere you wish within this uh, range. So anywhere between these lines, you can create a method. It doesn't matter whether it's before main or after main, Java doesn't care about that. Mm. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's uh, be copycats and do what main does. Well, it, it's a method, so why not copy that? Let's see what we can do. Okay, so let's copy everything. And 
we can't name it main because it's another piece of code. It's a piece of code which is going to print a line of symbols. So let's call it that print line of symbols. Okay, what is this line we're pr printing? Well, this is the code we want to execute. We want to execute this print line operation in this print line of symbols method. Now, what we have here are the so-called uh, method arguments or method parameters. And we don't really care about those. We don't want to supply parameters at this point. We'll see how we can do that further on. So let's remove those. So what we're left with is a public keyword, which by the way, we can do without. It's not necessary while we're doing single file Java um, applications. We won't, be need, we, we won't need to care about what public, private, and protected mean. We will see, them, we will see those things in other lessons further on. So what we will need to leave in is this static and this void. Now, what do they mean? Well, we'll figure that out in some time, but uh, short info about the static part. Well, uh, static methods can only call other static methods of the same class. Now we're in, inside the same main class, meaning that the main static method can only call other static methods. If our method isn't marked static, main will not be able to call it if it's in the same class, like it is in our case. So, how do we deal with that? Uh, we just place that static keyword. Now, void means that our method will not produce a result. It can have side effects, like printing on the console, but it will not produce a result. Okay, so that's it. Now, instead of writing this piece of code down, instead of writing system.out.println and supplying the symbols which need to be printed, I just say print line of symbols, and that's it. And then I say the same over here at the bottom line, the bottom result. Okay, so this is a method. A method is a named piece of code. You can have as many lines of code as you want over here. And main will uh, still be able to call this method print line of symbols. And printing this line of symbols will still yield the same result on the console, which is uh, outputting a line of dollars with a certain length. Okay, so... How do we make this more interesting? Well, we do have a print line of symbols, but that's not really an ideal method for us. So we can only use it in only one single exact way. And that one single exact way we can use this print line of symbols method is by printing these dollar signs. Okay, so let's start modifying this. Let's say that it's possible that my conditions, that my requirements for the project I'm implementing change. A lot of stuff can change, but something that seems very likely to change is the length of these symbols. So I'm saying print a line of symbols, but how long is that line of symbols? Well, nobody knows. So the, it, there, there could be three symbols or 10 symbols or 100 symbols. And that seems, something, it seems like something that hasn't been well defined in the specifications of my project since it's just printing a line of symbols. And it could change. And since it could change, let's... Uh, Let's implement this print line of symbols method in such a way that I'm not in danger of having to rewrite it again once uh, some specification changes. So, uh, what do I have in mind? Well, instead of printing a fixed string of symbols, let's just print symbol by symbol a fixed number of times. So we'll still keep it fixed. We'll st still keep it uh, printing a fixed number of items, but at least we'll have it as a variable. So if someone changes my specification and says, I don't want, um, how many symbols do we have? 19 symbols in this uh, line of symbols. I want 10. I want it to be easy for us to, to print that. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we obviously need a for loop, which starts from i equals zero and continues until we reach 19. Okay, and on each execution, it just prints on the console this dollar sign that we want printed. Now, how did I figure out that these are 19 symbols? Well, I marked them and here down at uh, the status bar of, um, of IntelliJ, we can see the number of symbols which we have selected. For example, now I have two characters selected. Okay, so I have this implemented and now I don't need the print line over here anymore. But I do need 
Actually, I do need the print line, but I don't need to print the symbols inside it. So I need a new line to be printed. Why? Well, because I called my method a print line of symbols method. So it should print a line. So it should finish its output by printing a line. And what else can I fix? Well, I don't really like having a value directly here in code. At least not, I don't like having that value as a magic value. Let's just name that value something. So I press Control Alt and V after marking this value and I'd say this is the length, length of the symbols I'm, symbols I'm printing. Now it's not this, a super descriptive name, but considering that it's contained inside the print line of symbols method, it's uh, pretty reasonable for me to assume that length means the length of the symbols I'm printing a line of. So names of variables and of methods in that uh, relation should be uh, sh should be appropriate for the context in which they exist. So length in a method of print line of symbol in a method named print line of symbols is kind of obvious uh, to the reader that it should probably mean that this is the length of that line of symbols. Whereas length in main doesn't really tell you length of what. Okay, but if you have a named block of code which uh, by, uh, which you uh, reference with this uh, variable, then it, it is easier to understand. Okay, so we have our length, we have our length of 19 symbols, and we're running a for loop which prints those 19 symbols. Now, if I start this code, it will do the exact same thing again. So I haven't really changed anything, I've just reworked the way I do it. Now, how can I improve this even further? Well, this print line of symbols, I didn't really change that much from from the perspective of the, the the developer. Yeah, that print line of symbols method changed in such a way that it can now print multiple uh, symbols and it can be easily changed. This method can be easily changed to print as many symbols as we want. We wouldn't have to, you know, type in just different numbers of symbols and count them by hand. We can just give a numerical value of how many symbols we want printed. Okay, so that's good, but from the point of view of the user of this method, which in this case is the main method, this is still a method that can be only used in one way. It can only print a fixed line of sim a fixed length of line of symbols, and we can't really tell it what that length needs to be. Okay, so let's make this thing into a parameter which allows our method to be called to execute for a different num different lengths of lines of symbols. So this is currently just a variable inside our print line of symbols method. It lives inside the print line of symbols method the same way that if we had a variable inside main, it would live inside, its lifetime would match the, the, the code block of main. So here, print line of symbols variables like this one live during the, the lifetime of that method. Okay, and this int i variable, on the other hand, lives within this for loop's lifetime. So during the whole execution of the for loop. So this is just a normal variable. Now let's change this variable so that external users of the print line of symbols method can change the length of the printed symbol line. How do we do that? Well, we take this length variable and we move it up here. Now this initializes it in exactly the same way. It will still live inside this uh, body of the print line of symbols method, the same way it lived there when it was just a normal variable inside the print line of symbols method. So whether you declare it over here or you declare it over here, doesn't change its lifetime inside the print line of methods method, uh, print line of symbols method. Okay, now we have this set to 19 but we can't anymore set it to 19 because this is now a parameter. This is something that gets supplied from the outside. And, after, and if we scroll downwards and reach the print line of symbols call, we will notice that here we have compilation errors now. What do these compilation errors say? Well, you can't call print that line of symbols because it requires a single parameter of type integer and you're trying to call it without any parameters. So here we're saying call print line of symbols, execute it, these brackets mean execute it, but we don't supply any parameters to this print line of methods method, uh, print line of symbols method. Okay, so if we want 19 symbols to be printed now, 
instead of initializing length over here, which would mean that print line of symbols would always execute the same way, instead of doing that, we supply a parameter and that parameter we provide from the caller, from the call site. This is a call site of the print line of symbols method. So main calls print line of symbols and this is the site where it is being called, it, where it is being executed. And we're going to call it and tell it, well, when we're calling it, we're going to tell it print 19 symbols. And then we'll do the same down here for this print line of symbols. And of course, this could be extracted into a variable and we could call this variable length or uh, re replace it. And now I'd name it header length because length in main isn't that obvious as it is in print line of symbols. So header length now in main makes more sense because this is what we're printing. We're pr printing a header. We're actually printing also a footer if we consider this to, have, to be a footer, but uh, you, you get the idea. It, it's good to have more meaningful names than just length or height or whatever, if, if it's not obvious what they mean. Okay, so print line of symbols now can be parameterized. So I can call print line of symbols from any uh, place in my code, from anywhere, from main, it, I can even call it from itself, but I won't do that now. Uh, I can print, I can call print line of symbols from anywhere in my code and I can parameterize it so I can print any number of symbols I want. Okay, so, uh, and again, this is just a copy of the value I submitted. So this is just a variable which is, gets initialized as if I've, if it's, as if I just said that this for loop was over here replacing this method and as if I had a variable int length equal to header header length. So this is the exact equivalent of what's happening when I write instead of this for loop, instead of this body of the method, uh, if I write just the call to the method. So if I say print line of symbols of header length, this is exactly equal to this code. Exactly one to one correspondence in from the point of view of the uh, from the point of view of the results of the program the execution is a bit different and we'll talk about that at the end of the lecture okay but effectively what you'd see is the same uh, the same process the same output okay so now we've replaced a bunch of lines of code with a single line of code which does their job we're, we haven't exactly replaced them, we've written them somewhere else and we can call them again and again and, and now we're saving from repeating this code. So I'm, co I'm using one line of code to execute four lines of code or even more if this method was longer. Okay, so that's one parameterization. What else can we parameterize on print line of symbols? It's still printing a line of symbols with a length which we specify as a parameter. Okay, what else can we uh, parameterize here? Well, obviously we can parameterize what the symbols are because we're currently only printing dollars. Uh, imagine that we need to print uh, whatever, we're, whatever our program does. Imagine that that program, uh, w let's say it, it ex it, we need to sell this program in a country which doesn't really like dollars. It has its own currency or, or symbols. So let's say that we want to print stars now. Uh, for people that don't like do dollars, maybe they'll like stars. So, how do we do that? Well, currently, the only way to do that is to change the print line of symbols functioning and change this to a star. And that's all fine and good, but we'd have to be ch changing or writing a new method for each print, uh, for, for each type of printing we want, for each sequence of symbols, uh, for each type of symbol we want printed. So that's not exactly ideal. What can we do? Well, we can supply another parameter. We already supplied the length parameter. And what I'd say is I'd add a new first parameter, which is the symbol I want to be printed. Now, each parameter inside the parameters list of this method needs to have a data type and a name associated with it. And parameters are separated with commas. So I'll, uh, I'll supply a first parameter over here and I'll call it char symbol the character which i need printed on the console this amount of time so how will i call this print line of symbols now well, i'll say print line of symbols with this print this symbol this many times this amount of times okay so now i'm not printing dollar i'm printing symbol 
Okay, so now print line of symbols makes a lot more sense in the name department because why? Well, because it prints a line of symbols and the symbol it prints is specified as a parameter. It's not a part of the name. So it prints a line of this thing with this length. Okay, so now if I want this code to continue to print dollars, I just need to supply the first parameter as a dollar. And I need to supply it again over here. And again, I'm just parameterizing my method and allowing it to be called in different ways in different places. Now, if I decide that my header will be dollars, whereas my footer will be stars, I can easily do that now. Now, I executed the code with, do with the dollar parameters and that's all fine and good. But if I want this method to function differently in different call sites, now I can do that. So now I can say, okay, so the top line, I want it to be stars and the bottom line, I want it to be dollars. Okay, so we're changing from stars to dollar, dollars. Starting this, let's see what happens. Well, I have a line of stars at the top, then welcome to methods, and welcoming us to methods, we get the dollars. Well, that seems great. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a method which is customizable, which can do different things based on different parameters we supply to it. Well, this is what a method is. This Again, this is a very basic exa example of a method, but it's a good example nonetheless because it allows you to write code which can execute with different parameters and do different things based on these different parameters. Now, we don't really have branching over here in this method, but we could. We could have conditional statements. We could have more loops. We could have other method calls even. We could have initializations of arrays. Anything we can do in main, we can do over here in print line of symbols as, uh, as a code concept. Now, what we need to do, of course, is different depending on the different situation, but we have no limitations in other methods. So basically, whether the method is called main or something else, it can do anything we have uh, learned up to this point. Okay, so this is what a method is. So now let's see more formally what uh, we need to know about methods. So a method is just a named block of code, a piece of code that has a name and can be called from other places. So you define it somewhere in the main class of the Java program. You can define it in other places too, but for now we're, that's where we're going to define our methods. You can define it before or after the main method. The main method doesn't really care where its print line of symbols is located as long as it's somewhere inside the main class and it's static, okay? And here's a, another sample of a method. Here we have a static void print hello. Again, this public is not really necessary at this point. So my suggestion is avoid it since it's not necessary. It doesn't really help you uh, in the future if you're writing public everywhere. So just avoid that public call. And we have this method which is called print hello and that prints on the console some information. Okay, now the Method bodies which we're going to be writing will always need to be surrounded by these curly brackets. Unlike the if statements and the loops, the, these brackets are always absolutely obligatory. Your code will not compile if you don't have these brackets. Okay, so how do you call it? Well, you just enter the name of the method and then you follow that up by brackets. And if that method accepts parameters, well, you supply the parameters in those brackets. Now, why would we use methods? Well, we already sort of illustrated that uh, briefly and we will keep seeing it into while uh, viewing this lesson. But simply put, you can split problems into smaller pieces. You've already seen how, what my approach to solving problems is. I like to break them up into parts and solve parts by parts by parts. Well, a method is a great way to separate out a part of your code. And it also allows easier testing of your code. Not only can you organize it better and can you read it better, meaning that look at this code now, it says, okay, so I'll print a line of symbols. So that that's much more clearer than just system.out.print. It, it signals the intention of your code. You want to print a line of symbols. What symbols? Well, this, these symbols with this length. Then you're printing a message and then you're printing another line of symbols. This makes code much easier to read because you describe your intentions instead of just invoking built-in functionality. Okay, so you have the, the bonus of better organization and readability because you know what they do. And it allows you to avoid repeating code because 
like we have here. We just recall this method and the code gets executed automatically without us having to copy paste it everywhere where the method is. And that allows very, um, of course it allows uh, very much easier writing of code because you, if you have to change something, you just change it in one single place, not in seven. And another thing they really improve is testing because once you have your program broken down into manageable pieces, each of these pieces can be tested independently of the others. Whereas if you have a single huge main method, well, that can't easily be tested. Whereas if you separate it into smaller methods, you can test each part of your program by testing the appropriate method. Okay, so what we saw now was the void method. A void method simply executes some code between brackets. So it's really just a named piece of code and it can accept parameters, but it doesn't create a result. Now you might say, well, Sure it does, sure it creates a result. I just saw the result printed on the console. Yes, but that's not the result, that, that's not the result of the execution of the method, meaning that I can't take this method and assign it to a variable. I can't say x equals print line of symbols. I can't do that. I can't create a local variable of some type. There's no variable type void. Void just means no data. So there's no variable type void, there's no data type void. So I can't create a variable which gets the value of uh, this operation. Whereas if you compare that to math.apps uh, of minus five, I can assign this to a variable. I can say x equals apps from the value minus five and I can get an integer from that or I can get a double from that and so on. So calculating an absolute value returns a result. So when we're saying that void methods do not have a result, this is what we mean. We mean that their execution, the, the result of their execution cannot be assigned to a variable. That's what uh, having a return value means. Apps has a return value, in this case it's an integer, and that value can be assigned to a variable. Okay, so void methods don't return anything, they just do something. Typically they print something on the console or sometimes they modify parameters which are passed into them and we will talk about that when we get to, um, when we get to value, value and reference types, how that happens. Okay, so this prints hello on the console and calling uh, and doing this, whether we do this in main or we do this in a print hello method, both are methods. So anything you can do in main, you can do in a print hello method or whatever you decide to name it. Now, we have a part here about naming and best practices, but I'm going to skip over that in favor of seeing through all of the concepts of methods and creating methods and uh, supplying parameters and returning values and uh, how these parameters are, are affected by the difference in value and reference types. And once we know everything about methods, then we'll come back to how we should be naming them and how we should be organizing code inside them. However, when you review your lecture at home, and this is why these slides are in this position, when you review your lecture back home, you should go through this naming and best practices section because you already know what, uh, how methods are created and how they are declared and how they are described, what parameters they take and how they return values. And then this will make a lot more sense while you're progressing through the lecture so you know why we've chosen the namings we've chosen. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this part and I'm going to jump right into the declaring and invoking methods parts. Now, we already saw that as an example in my code before we started the actual lesson. Now, let's see it a bit more formally. So what you write when you uh, create a method, first off, you start by public and static for now. This is not really syntax that's um, always obligatory when you're writing methods. It's uh, an artifact of how we're writing our programs currently. Hence, we're going to have to write it initially and then we'll start uh, getting rid of it. Okay, so public static for now, you need it. Later on, we'll find ways where we will not be needing this. Okay, and then the significant part comes from here on out. First thing you type in is the return type of the method. Now for void methods, this is going to be void, meaning they don't return a result. They don't have a result that is assignable to a variable then you have the method name. The method name is simply the identifier which you use to invoke the method later on. For example, if you're in the main, 
uh, in the main method and you want to call this print text method you would say print text referencing it by its name the same way you would reference a variable by its name okay and here we have the parameters here we have the parameters which you supply to print text when calling them in this case in order to call the method print text you have to supply some text which needs to be printed for example this is the text um, hello okay so this is the param these are the parameters and there can be more many of them they get separated by commas i already told you that and each of these parameters has to have a data type a data type and a name so data type name comma next parameter data type name comma next parameter and so on until you fill in all the parameters you need and this over here is the method body just like for loops have a body and just like conditional statements have a body methods also have a body which should always be surrounded by brackets now all methods are declared inside classes actually in programming what uh, this would typically be called is a subroutine or a function. A function is just what you see over here, a code which has a name. And if a function is located inside a class, like it's obligatory to do in Java, it's called a method. That's why in Java you're going to see them called methods, whereas in JavaScript or C++ you're usually going to see them called functions unless they're parts of classes. But in Java, they always need to be inside classes and that's why they're called methods. I'm telling you this not because terminology is that important, but because it is important when you're searching for stuff in Google. So you don't get confused why there's uh, in one language they're called one way and another they're, they're called another way. Okay, so main is also a method because it is a function located inside the main class. Okay. And variables inside the method are local variables. They are called local because they are only visible for that method. The same way that variables inside main are only visible inside main. So anything inside some kind of brackets is visible inside those brackets. Except when we get to classes and objects where it's, it's pretty much the same, uh, but there are a few, the semantics are a bit different there. So while, while we're talking about methods or code blocks in general, anything declared inside a code block is only visible inside that code block. Okay, so continuing, continuing on from here, how do we call a method? Well, we just uh, implement that method and then after we have that method implemented, we invoke it by using the, its method name followed by these curved brackets. So in main to call print header we just say print header and follow that up with the brackets now these are uh, obligatory you can't just say print header and not supply these if you just say print header and don't supply these you're just referencing the code of the method you're not executing it so in order to execute something you need to place these brackets even if they're empty even if you don't supply anything to them just like system system dot dot out dot print line you can call this without supplying any parameters inside it but if you don't if you omit these brackets the code will not compile so you need the brackets okay so this is a method invocation it executes the code in, call in, uh, the code inside the method what actually happens is java sees okay i need to go into this method and it goes visits this method executes this line of code and then returns after the end of that method and continues the execution of the code which we had in main okay so you can invoke methods from main of course because main is just a method you can invoke methods from themselves which is called recursion and, and this isn't really something you want to do like this there are uh, there are applications of the concept of recursion, but we won't be covering them in this uh, lesson because it's going to uh, become too wide of a lesson and you're going to lose your focus. We are going to discuss them further on, however, and it's a very important concept in programming. But for now, we won't be calling methods from their own bodies. And there are other ways to call methods, and namely that is calling them from other methods. So, for example, if you're printing a header, you may have a method which is print header top and print header bottom. Like, for example, if you consider this uh, thing which we're printing here, the entire thing a header, well, this might be considered the header top, and this might be considered the header bottom, and this might be considered the header message. So, let's say that we can make this into a method, and we can say that this is actually a parameter to this method, which is um, header, header title. 
So this is the title we're printing. And now we have a header title and a header length. And uh, okay, let's put this header length back inside this part of the code. So what am I doing now? I'm taking out the header title and I'm grouping this code together. Guess what I'm going to do from this point on? I'm going to make this into a method so I can print different headers with different messages, with different titles, uh, multiple times without having to write the code again. So I can now mark this code, press Alt and R, or just pick the refactor menu from up here, and then go to Extract or just press X, and then go to Method or just press M. And when I do that, Java or IntelliJ more specifically will uh, offer to create a method for me instead of me having to write the method myself. It will create it as a void method. It will accept a string parameter named header title, this header title over here which I created. And the method will look something like this. Again, this, ignore this private or public or whatever part. This will be what the method looks like. And I need to name it somehow. So let's say this is print header. Okay, and now I have print header which, which accepts a header title. And by the way, since the method is called print header, you don't need to call this a header title because it's, if you just call it title, it's obvious that it's the header's title, not something else's title. So now we just have a single call in main. And now we can inline even this variable. And I can say just print header. And that calls the method print header, which prints a line of symbols and then prints a message, the title, and then prints another line of symbols. And how does it do that? Well, it by calling other methods. So methods can call other methods. It's completely fine. Just how main can call the print header method. Well, the same way the print header method can call the print line of symbols method. And now look how neat and tight our main method looks like. And now we can have some other logic here, which doesn't concern itself with how headers are printed. There's someone else that is responsible for printing headers. Okay. So this is, these are the ways of invoking methods. Now we already saw how we can supply parameters to those methods, but again, let's see it more formally, how it looks like. So what uh, can method parameters be? You can supply any type of parameters to a method. For example, here's a method which accepts two parameters, a start and an end, and it prints the numbers from that start number to that end number. So two integer parameters. How would we call it if we want to call this method to print the numbers from 13 to 42? How would we call it from main? Well, we type in print numbers. And then if we want to start from 13, we type in 13 as the first parameter and 42 as the second parameter. Of course, we can have uh, these in, saved into variables or read from the console or whatever. Anything works. Any way of supplying a value over here would work. Okay. So print numbers is called like this from main. Or if we want to read these from the console, we can simply say scanner.nextint if we have a scanner and that would read the first number and then scanner.nextint for reading the second number over here. Okay. So when you're invoking a method, you're supplying the parameters. Now you can have zero parameters on a method like we have, actually we don't have such an example in our methods. Um, but if we create a method which, which is called print default title, uh, default header, now we have a method which accepts no parameters. And that method calls the print header method with the parameter welcome to methods. And that one calls print line of symbols with two parameters. So you can have any number of uh, delegations of responsibility here. So we now have a method that prints the default header, whatever that header uh, seems to be. And the print default header method knows what a default header means and it passes it on to the print header method, which doesn't need, doesn't know what a, a default header mean, means, but it knows what a header means as long as it's provided a title. And from there on out, the print line of symbols method doesn't even know what a header is, but it can print a line of symbols as long as you provide it with the symbols and the length and so on. So each parameter inside the method has a name and it has and a data type. So always you name the data type and then you name the name of the parameter, the identifier of the, of the parameter, then you place a comma and then you supply the next parameter and so on. Okay, so 
we have a problem here of uh, how do we print the sign of an integer number. Uh, we have to create a method which when it sees 2 prints number 2 is positive, when it sees minus 5 prints number minus 5 is negative, and otherwise if we have the number 0 it prints the, num the number is 0. Okay, let's do that quickly. So we'll come over here and we'll create a method, a public static, actually we can avoid the public part, we can create a method named um, which is a static void method and we'll name it uh, print number sign because that's what we're doing we're printing the sign of a number or we're printing number sign info maybe because we're not just printing the sign we're also say saying a bunch of other stuff so let's say this is our number which we're getting as a parameter and what are we going to do well if that number is larger than zero then we will be printing system dot out dot print line the number percent s uh, percent d is and percent s is some something so the number number is positive okay so uh, we don't want a print line actually we want a print f and let's add a new line symbol at the end now I'd be doing the same for uh, the same call the same formatting call but with different parameters right for uh, negative so uh, else if the number is less than zero then I need to print this thing again but with the value of negative and I th think about how I can extract this so I don't repeat code but this is something I'm going to leave to you and in the final else if it's not larger than zero and if it's not less than zero then it's probably zero and then I'll say the number is percent d over here and just print out the number or I can just say the number is zero that would also be valid oh no it's actually the number zero is zero that's what I need to print okay so you, do you notice a pattern here everything is the same except this string at the end so what am I going to do well instead of printing each time I will just have a single print and I'll say string the uh, sign info is a string which gets initialized in this case to sign info to positive and in the other case it gets initialized sign info gets initialized to negative and in this case sign info gets initialized to zero and now I have only a single print statement which prints not positive but prints what prints sign info okay so what did I do well I removed the repeating code which I execute in all of the branching scenarios I moved it out of the branching and the thing I put into the branching was the determination of the info I print at the end so if I start this program nothing special will happen because I'm not calling this method right and you can notice that by the fact that it's grayed out IntelliJ detects that I'm not calling this at all okay so let's call that method let's leave our header alone and let's create a new scanner tell it to read from system.in add a save that into a scanner variable that this scanner object I save it into this scanner variable and now I will say uh, print number sign info from scanner dot give me the next integer and if I start this thing it will accept, expect me to enter an integer number and for that integer number it will print this sign information which I described over above in the print sign info method. So if I write minus, minus 5, I get the number minus 5 is negative. And I can test around with the other values if it works correctly. We're not going to do that now because we're in a lecture and this is something you should try at home with uh, by writing this code by yourself. Okay, so here is also a way of implementing this. Now here we have the repetition of this code. Now this is also a valid solution. However, I don't like it that much due to the repetition of this uh, same operation multiple times. By the way, you could also extract a method for this. Think about how you can do that. Instead of extracting a variable, think about how you can ext extract a method. Okay, there's another problem over here. We have um, we need to implement a method that receives a grade between 2.0 and 6.0 and prints the corresponding grade in words. So if we get between 2 and 2.99 inclusively, so if we get something between 
if grade is um, larger than or equal to 2.0 and and this grade is less than 3 then we need to print fail and otherwise if not that we need to print if in 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 the other case in which the grade is uh, larger than um, larger than or equal to 3 but less than uh, 3.5 3.5 we need to uh, print poor and in the other case we need to print if it's larger than if it's larger than or equal to 3.5 and less than um, 4.49 meaning less than 4.5 we need to print good and so on so this is just a bunch of if statements how would our method look like well I'm, our method would look like um, what does it do first off it's a void method it's a static void method what does our method do well it simply prints information about the sign so uh, about the grade so print grade name maybe or print grade description and what is it going to get as a parameter well it's going to get a grade what's what's the grade in this case a double a double grade and then it will just open the brackets and do the if statements and in each if statement print the necessary thing that's our method and then we just need to call it from the main and see what it prints that's the solution we won't be coding it now we'll leave it for as something for you to try out at home it shouldn't be very much complicated than what we did uh, previously so here's an example of how you can do it but my suggestion is try to solve this problem by yourselves and try to solve all of the problems which we see here even if I've solved them for you for yourself because that is how you um, build experience with coding now uh, another problem over here we will solve with the problem is we need to print a triangle now how do we print this triangle well notice that there is a pattern here so if we say that this triangle is of three elements we should print a line of a single element then of two elements then of three elements and then reduce to two elements and reduce to one element now we could do that in a single method we can implement a method that is just named print triangle but there's a pretty obvious subtask to this print triangle task what is that subtask well that subtask is printing a single line of numbers right you print a line of numbers starting from one number and starting from one always actually and ending in a number you supply as a what it changes right so in one case it's one number then it's two numbers then it's three numbers well you supply you supply the end number you the start number is always one but the end number you supply it additionally so let's implement that so what i'll implement is i'll first implement a print line method and then i'll implement the print triangle method using the print line method so um i'd write that this method I type in that this method is a void method since it's going to be printing and I'd call it print and what is this exactly it's an increasing sequence right it starts from one and it increases to two and then it increases to three so print increasing sequence and I'd supply the end number the last number and the last number that needs to be printed okay and what will I do in this printing of an increasing sequence? Well, I'd start a for loop from zero, from actually, from what? From one, right? Because I'm starting from the value of one always. So I'll start more loop from the value of one. And I'll continue to last, but I will continue inclusively because I want to say print increasing sequence of three. And if I do that, I want this printed on the console. Okay. So now what do we need to do? We just need to print out to the console this number with the space after it. So now I have this number followed by a space and that is my description of the print increasing sequence method. And now I can print the line after that system.out.println so that I can finish this print increasing sequence with the new line so that when I print the next increasing sequence it starts on the new line. Okay. So here I have a single part of the solution, uh, the part which prints one single line. 
okay, what is the bigger part of the solution? Well, I need to go here and print a line that reaches one, then I need to go here and print a line that reaches two, then go here and print a line that reaches three, and then start reducing. Print a line that reaches two and print a line that reaches one. So up to this part, I'm running a for loop that increases from one to three, and then I'm running another for loop which decreases from three minus one to one. Okay, so that seems pretty simple. Let's now implement our static void print triangle method, triangle, and I supply the parameter which describes the triangles, what is this? It's a width, right? So if I, it's not the height, it's the width. It's not exactly a, a great name for a parameter, but it's better than, uh, it, it's descriptive enough if you know the context of the task. So print triangle with this width, and how will I be printing this triangle? Well, I'll start a for loop, starting from i equals one, because that's where this is starting, a single, uh, a single item in a line, okay? And I'll continue until I get to the width, inclusively to the width, okay? And for each iteration of the loop, what will I be doing? Well, I'll be printing an increasing sequence. So I'd say print increasing sequence. And how long is that sequence going to be? Well, it's going to match the number in the, con the control variable of the loop, i. Okay, so I'll print that increasing sequence and then I'll start from width minus one because for here I start, I'm starting from two. So I have a width of three, this is three. And then I, after I print this part, which I'm doing over here, then I need to print the next part, which just begins from the length over here, minus one, the width actually, minus one. So starting from width, minus one, continuing until I reach with one, I'm printing again an increasing sequence. And now I just need to read the number from the console, which is the triangle width, and I'll create a new scanner for that, tell that scanner to read from system.in, and read the next integer from there. And now I'll just say, okay, so I have the width now, and print a triangle with that width. Pretty simple, huh? Looks, uh, it, it, I, actually, I know it wasn't simple while I was writing it and I was doing it sort of quickly because I want to uh, let you go into a break so you can refer refresh your minds. But uh, even if it seemed complicated while I was writing it, if you study it item by item, it really isn't. That's the power of methods. It breaks up your code into parts and it's, if you're finding it hard to understand this uh, solution well just understand this part first see how that works then understand this part see how that works and then understand well this part is pretty simple but understand that and see how that works so you can understand you, once you understand how one part works you can treat it as a black box and just imagine that it works that way and not care about its co the code itself because you're not seeing it all the time okay let's en enter three whoa we messed up something Okay, let's see what we messed up. We're going to stop this code and we're going to... Um, I already see what I messed up. Do you see what I messed up? It's kind of boring when you always when you see your problem quick, quickly, but since this is... This seems like an infinite loop, right? So there's a problem with the loop continuation. Is this an infinite loop? Well, it doesn't seem like it would be. It starts from one and continues until it's less than last and it increases all the time and nothing else touches i. Okay, so it's probably not this. Is this one an increasing loop? It starts from one and continues up to width and increases i. Doesn't seem like it's going to be an infinite loop. However, look at this part. I'm starting from width equals, uh, from i equals width minus one and continuing until I reach one inclusively, but I'm not reducing, I'm increasing. So I'll never reach one. Well, not never. I'll reach it after integer overflows and uh, travels all through the negative values of integer and then reaches one and then it will stop, which is really isn't, really isn't ideal. So what I need here is minus minus, not plus plus, because I'm going down on the values. Okay, so three, and we have our triangle one, two, three. Okay, so I'll leave you with this for a few minutes to... Uh, get a rest for your head and of course there's another solution over here which you can check out it's sort of 
similar to what I uh, implemented. And if you have questions again about this, you can ask in the channels um, of our, which we have provided for you to ask questions in and you will uh, receive some answers. And ask your colleagues too and communicate with them and play around with them. What have we seen up to this point? Well, we've seen how to create a method, a void method, and how to pass parameters to that method. What we haven't seen yet is the return keyword. The return keyword just ends the execution of any method immediately. It doesn't matter whether it's in a loop, in, an, in a conditional statement, and whatever. The moment you meet a return statement, the method ends its execution. That's it. No more execution for that method until it's called the next time. Okay, so let's actually see that quickly. Let's create a method which prints an array of integers until it reaches a negative value. So it prints all the values of an array of integers unless it reaches a negative value, in which case it immediately stops. So let's ignore this uh, triangle and scanner part. Let's create an array of integers, let's call it numbers. And let's initialize that with a new integer array containing the numbers one, two, uh, minus, let's, okay, let's one, add more, one more number, three, minus one, five, six. So let's have this array of numbers. Okay, and I'll create a method which is called print numbers until print numbers stop on negative. So it, it's a sort of a weird method name, but it's not a method that you would typically be writing. It's just an illustrative method on what return uh, does. So now I'll supply this numbers parameter. Now you say, wait, we haven't created such a method. Well, 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 we will tell IntelliJ to create it. So I press Alt and Enter and I select create a method. It creates this method for me. It creates its parameter, which is the integer array of numbers, which I need added into it. And now, how do I print an array of numbers? Well, I just run a for loop and I actually can do a for each loop, right? So I can iterate these numbers with the for each loop and say, if number less than zero, then return. This is the new keyword we're, we're uh, encountering. Otherwise, just system.out.print this number with a space after it. Okay, so what will this do? Well, starting the program, we will say that only one, two, and three are printed and nothing after that is printed. So only one, two, and three. Why? Well, because the code encountered a number which is less than zero, meaning that it entered into this conditional statement and accessed the return keyword, which immediately ended the execution of this method. Doesn't matter that it's in a conditional statement, which is inside the loop, it immediately breaks out of the method. It's it's sort of like the break statement inside loops, but in this case, it's a full breaking of the entire method, not just of the loop. So it directly exits the loop. So this is what re the return keyword can do for void methods. Void methods don't need a return keyword, but if you add it somewhere, it will immediately stop the execution of the method. Okay, so if you're using it for a non-void method, the concept of the return keyword is to, for that to be used to return an actual value. So you have a method and that, uh, that method returns a value which you can assign to some variable. Okay, so let's do that. Let's implement a method which, what can our method do? We already have an array of integers. Let's do, some, let's do something with that array of integers. For example, let's uh, implement a method that counts the number of positive numbers inside an array of integers. Should be kind of simple. So let's say count positive in numbers. That's what I'll call my method. I'll say alt and enter create this method. Okay, so I'll leave it void for now and then we'll figure out how to make it a non-void method. So this is our array of numbers. Let's iterate that array of numbers. And what do we need to do? We need to count the positive numbers in that array. So in order to count positive numbers, I need to have a counter. So int num positive. This is my counter. What should it start from? Well, it should start from zero. And if I encounter a number for which it is true that the number is larger than zero, then num positive will be increased by one. I will bump it up by one. Okay, so num positive is now increased by one whenever it encounters 
a number in numbers which is positive. Okay? And now, after this method has ended, after all of the numbers have been iterated, I can do return this num positive value. Now, I'm getting a compilation error here. Why? Well, because my method is void and I'm trying to return a value from it. The thing which you write after the return statement is the value which this method should return. And in, in, or, in order for the method to be able to return such a value, it has to have a return type that matches the value that you're returning. So the return value has to match the return type. In this case, it doesn't. It is an integer, whereas the return type of my method is void, meaning it has no return. So in order for this method to be able to return a value, I need to change this void type into an int type. And now this code will compile. And now if I print this on the console, I actually now if I just count the positive numbers, nothing will happen, right? Actually, it will happen, but I won't see any result because I'm not printing the result on the console. Now, this method actually has a result which is assignable to a variable, meaning that I can say x equals count positive and create a variable x, which I assign with that value of the number of positive numbers in this array. So now I can system.out.print a line with that x number and I will see the output which is contained in that x variable which contains the number of positive numbers in that list of numbers which is in this case 5. So 3 over here and 2 over here, 5 numbers. My program is correct. So this is what uh, a returning method does. It calculates some value and it returns that value to the caller of the method. So the caller of the method can use that value as, for example, a, a variable which can be saved or the caller of the method can place that result of the method inside the print line statement so they can directly print the result of that operation or do something else with it or supply it to another method or uh, use it in an expression and so on. So any method that returns a value can be assigned to a variable. It's, uh, the, the result of its execution can be assigned to a variable. Okay, so here we have another example, a read full name method which returns a string. It accepts a scanner parameter, the scanner used to read from the console, and it uses it to read two names from the console and concatenate them into a single string. Okay, so uh, anything, any method that returns a value can be assigned to variables, can be assigned to expressions, can be passed to other methods, like when we do uh, scanner.nextLine, we pass that into, uh, pass the return value of this as a parameter to the parsint method. The parsint method is just a method, just like the next line method is just a method also. We'll see how to write methods like the next line method further on. But this is a method, it returns the value, and that value is then passed on as a parameter to the parsing method in the integer class. Okay, so here's an example problem. Now, instead of solving this problem, which is pretty simple, we just need to uh, code a method which calculates, uh, which multiplies a width by a height and gives us the result. Instead of implementing this method, let's implement something which will be useful further on. So. In previous lessons, we learned how to read an array of integers from the console. So let's, let's remember how we were supposed to do that. So we have an array of integers on the console as a single line. So how do we read that from the console? Well, we don't know how many there are, but what we can do is create a scanner, tell it to read from system.in, name it scanner, create a variable for it, and then Tell it to read an entire line from the console. Now up to this point, we're just reading a line from the console. From here on out, we need to parse this line into an actual array of numbers. So this is our line, our line on the console. And from here on out, after we've done the reading part of the line, we need to convert this line, this string, into a, lot of, into a sequence of numbers. So what do I need to do? Well, we've already done this. We tell the line to get split by spaces. So split it into a, an array of strings, an array of strings, which is the, let's call it um, items. 
So we're getting the items by splitting the line by spaces. So each of these items will be a number, but a number represented as a string. And now these numbers I need to initialize with the same length that the items have. So initialize them, initialize them by items.length and then run a for loop starting from zero and continuing up until we reach numbers.length. And what will we do with that? Well, we'll set the numbers at position i to the value of items at position i, but we will convert that into an integer through integer.parsent. We've done this in previous lessons already, so I won't, uh, um, uh, I won't give it more time for explanations. You can uh, rewatch the previous lessons if you're still having trouble with this one, but it shouldn't be too hard at this point any longer. So after we've created this array of numbers, we have the numbers and we can use them. For example, we can pass them to count positive, pass them to the count positive functions as a numbers array and print that on the console system dot out dot print line print the line of the number of positive numbers in the numbers array okay but instead of writing this code over and over again these uh, five lines or whatever they are instead of writing these lines over and over again can't i make a method which returns this array of numbers and the answer is yes i can let's copy this code and let's create a method. How would I call this method? Well, since converting a single integer is from a string is called parse integer, converting multiple integers from uh, a string would be called parse integer array, for example. So I'd create a static method, which maybe will be void, but it actually won't be void, but let's call it a void method for now, and then we'll figure out what we need to return from it. So creating a void method, call it parse integers or parse integers array. Okay, what will I get as a parameter? I'll figure it out afterwards. So I'll copy the code that I'm going to be using to do the parsing and I'll see what's missing. Okay, well, IntelliJ automatically told me what's missing. So I copied the code and what am I missing? Well, I'm missing the line. So I'm missing the string input. So the string, even the string s, so because this might not be a line, someone might be calling parse integers on something they know contains integers, but it's not a line of strings. It may be a, a part of a line of strings. Okay, so parse integers. And now, instead of uh, this being a void method, what does it need to return? What's the result of this method? Well, what I'm creating is the numbers array. So what I need to return is the numbers array. Now, if I don't know how to change this void return type into a numbers array type, I can just go over here, press Alt and Enter and select the suggested fix, which is make the parse integers method return an integer array. OK, so I got that. And now I can just call this method and say numbers, the numbers array, instead of parsing it manually, I can just call the parse integers method and supply this line string and now I have my numbers generated from that line. So now I have a method which I can reuse in other code as well, which just reads a line of numbers. And this is very useful for exams because if you have such a method, well, you don't need to code it again. You can just copy paste it into your solution and call it from wherever you need it. Okay, so now we can parse a line of numbers and we can even shorten this code even long even more we can just say parse integers of the next line of the console it became a lot uh, more uh, neat than it was before right instead of having a huge for loop here which i need to read to understand what it does now i just see that okay i'm parsing an integers array from a string from the console instead of having to read through the code and understand what each part of that code does. I'm just following the names of the methods. Okay, so this code is going to work. Let's just test it uh, just in case I've made some mistake while coding it. So let's say the line of numbers is three minus four, 42, zero, 71. So the number of positive numbers is three, 42 and 71. Zero isn't a positive number. It's just a non-negative number. Okay. so pressing enter here exactly three positive numbers that's what i expected uh, as an output okay so 
it seems that this works. Now I test it a lot more before starting to use it again in every program I, uh, I implement, but this is the gist of what you need for reading lines of integers. Okay, so instead of solving this problem, we solved another problem and we actually helped ourselves write code further on. And you can study how this problem, problem was solved in, uh, in this solution. It's, pr it's a pretty simple method, it's just uh, a method that returns a multiplication of two values. Okay, another method, this one I'll leave to you again, a method which gets a string and repeats it as many times as necessary. Now, one advice, when you, if you're uh, using this solution, don't use a string over here, use a string builder. We will be talking about text processing and why uh, it is not good to append multiple times into a string, even though this solution will work. Uh, but until we get to that point, use a string builder over here and that will optimize the functionality of this repeat string method. Okay, so this method otherwise accepts a few parameters and just does an operation a few times. How does it repeat the string? Well, it just appends over and over again into the same string. It's a pretty simple uh, method to implement. And again, my suggestion is use a string builder and Google how you should be using that string builder to append into a string and to get the string result at the end. Okay, so another method, we have a method that should calculate and return the value of a number raised to a given power. So we, can, we would get two and then eight as values and we need to raise two to the eighth power. How would we do that? Well, let's implement that power function. So I'd call, what does this function do? It calculates a power. It's a static function. It returns a what? Well, here the numbers are double, so we will return a double number. Since we're raising a double number to a power, that result is going to be a double number. So uh, let's call this method power because it raises a number to a power. And the number we're, we're raising, it's actually not an integer, it's a double number we're raising to a power, and the integer power to which we're raising it. Because in this uh, task, we're expecting integer powers because non-integer powers are too complicated to implement uh, with the knowledge we have at this point. Okay, so what does this power method do? Well, it's going to multiply the number by itself a power number of times, meaning that we need to run a for loop again, starting from zero until we reach power and multiply number into itself that many times and then return this number. Now, there is something I'm missing over here. What if the power is zero? If the power is zero, I should return one, right? Any number to the zeroth power is simply zero. And actually, if the power is one, I shouldn't be multiplying the number by itself at all, right? So I should be multiplying the number, not power number of times, but power minus one number of times, because if I get one, I shouldn't be multiplying the number by itself at all. So instead of doing that, I could do the following, int uh, raised to power equals one, because a number, always a, a, a power number always starts from one and then, I'd multiply, multiply raised to power by number. In this case, if power is zero, this check will immediately fail. So I, which is zero, less than zero will return false. So I will not go into this for loop. So I will return raised to power, raised to power, which is the value one. If I get one, I will multiply raised to power with number exactly once and so on. Okay, so this is the power method. I won't be testing it uh, because that would uh, waste some of our time and we need to discuss some more important concepts, but you can test this method out. How would you call it? You'd just say, go over here and say system.out.println. Println what? Well, print line the power of scanner dot read the next integers, uh, read the next double, and scanner dot read the next integer. So we're reading the double number which we which we will be raising. So we're reading this, and then we're reading the integer for the power, and we're passing these on to the number and power parameters in the power method, and that calculates the power, returns the double result, and that double result we print on the console. 
I I sort of uh, pushed it uh, tighter than it needs to be, but I think you can understand what the sequence of operations does. And it's also good for you to learn to read such uh, tightly packed operations and uh, learn to examine them piece by piece. So you start from the innermost operations and then you continue on to the outer ones and then to the final outer one. So test this program at home, try uh, implementing your own solution, try implementing a solution with two returns. So another way to solve this problem of uh, raised to power being one is by what? Returning one if the power is zero. So if you see that power is zero on the first line, you can do if power equals zero, then return one. Otherwise start multiplying number by itself until you reach power minus one number of uh, multiplications. That, that's what my initial idea was. And then I decided to go back to have another variable and multiply in that. So play around with that solution. It will be useful for you to uh, see how two returns inside a single method cooperate. Okay, now that we've talked about return types, we need to talk about a bit about value and reference types. And that's actually got to do more with um, parameters of methods than it has to do with, um, with the return values, but it's important either way. So uh, what do I mean by value and reference types? Now, there's an example here, but in order for you to understand that, I need to show you something. Okay, so ignore the code which we've been writing up until now. And let's say we have a simple method which, re which doesn't return anything, and we'll call it increment. It will just increase a value. And we'll pass in the value x. And this value x we will increment by 1. This simply increases the value of x by 1. Okay, now let's ignore the scanner. And actually we'll not ignore the pr printing, but we'll print something else. We'll create a value variable a. We'll assign it the value 5. Or let's assign it the va value of 42 because 42 is the typical example value in programming. Okay, so what do we do from here on out? Well, let's say increment. Uh, by the way, this needs to be a static method. Increment a. And then let's print a on the console system dot out dot print line a okay what will happen over here what what's going what's the result going to be well think about it you can even gamble on it if you want uh, think about it and what's the result going to be well it's going to be 42 even though in this method we're increasing x by one now why does that happen well let's imagine this this wasn't a method let's imagine that we get this code over here and insert it in this place. So what will this code look like if I insert it in this place? Well, it would look like int x equals a and then x plus plus. Now, at this point, you shouldn't be surprised why a doesn't change, why a doesn't get incremented. It doesn't get incremented because what we're not incrementing a, we're incrementing another variable and that variable's value changes and First off, it gets assigned by A, and if we place a breakpoint over here and start the program, we will see that the breakpoint stops the program over here, and we will see that X is indeed 43, because it took the value of A, and then it increased it by 1. Okay, so that's valid, and A stays 42. Okay, so what happens when you supply an integer parameter to a method? Well, the method receives a copy of that integer parameter, kind of like what the for each loop does when you're iterating an array. If you change an element of, if you try to change the element which you're using for iteration, it's not actually changing the array, it's changing just the element which you are using, your local copy of that element. Okay, well, all fine and good then. Then in that case, what is going to happen if we have an int array x over here and we change its first element by increasing it by one? And let's say that we don't have the int variable here. We have an int array arr, and this array is initialized by an integer array, array with a single item. And let's say the single item is again 42. Okay, and now we are going to print the single item in that array. Okay, so what will happen now? We're receiving an array, 
of course we need to call the increment method to see if anything happens at all. We're initializing an array, we're passing it into the increment method and increasing the first, uh, first element inside that array. What's the output? 42 or 43? Well, if you follow the integer logic, it would have been 42. However, for an array, it isn't. It's 43. Okay, what happens here? Well, arrays and other objects, like for example the scanner, are so-called reference types. Now, there are many ways to understand this, but one way to deal with the concept is that reference types, when passed into a method, are passed by reference, meaning that when you access the type, you're accessing the underlying object. So this ARR object over here, it's actually, that's actually the, the variable name. The object itself is this thing, the initialization of an array with a value of 42. So this is the object. This is just a variable that points to that object so we can access it. Access it. But this one over here, this thing, is the object. Okay, so this is the object. When we're passing ARR here, what the method receives is just another pointer to that object. It still points to the same object. It's not a copy of the value like it was for the integer. For the integer number, there's no object. There's just an integer. It's just a number. And that number gets copied around. Whereas here, you don't get the number copied around. You only get the reference to that object copied around. So both ARR and X over here point to the same object. They refer to the same object. That's why they're reference types. They refer to objects. They're not the objects themselves. So ARR over here isn't an object, the way integer is a number. If you have an integer x, that, int that integer, this variable x, is the number itself. Whereas if you have an array, this thing isn't the array. This is just a name for this, this array which you initialize. The array is the thing you initialize with the keyword new. That's the object. This is the actual object. And when we assign it to a variable, that variable isn't the array, the object exactly. It just points to that object. So this variable ARR points to this object initialized here in this code. So when you pass that ARR around, when you pass that into the increment method, it receives another thing, another copy, which points to this same array. And since it points to the same array, editing that object will edit that array. So editing an element of that object will edit that array. And that's the difference between value types and reference types. And here's an example over here. If the cup is an integer, uh, actually this is the case for cup being an integer, if cup was an integer, so if cup was int, simply int, then when we're passing it around, we're actually passing in a copy of that integer. And whatever the fill cup method does, it does to the copy of the integer. But when we're passing by reference, if cup was an integer array, if this was an integer array over here, when you pass it around, you don't really pass around the cup, you pass the location of the cup. And whoever does filling the cup, whoever uh, executes the fill cup operation, will go to the actual cup and fill that. It won't fill a copy, it will fill the actual cup, because you're not passing around the actual cup over here, you're passing around the address of that cup, where that cup is located in memory. And that's why this fill cup method actually fills the original cup. So if you want to understand it simply, fill, uh, value types, primitive data types, double, int, uh, short, byte, char, uh, boolean, all of them get copied by, by a value, meaning that if you supply them to a method as a parameter, that method receives a copy. Whereas arrays are not copied. Imagine how long it would take if each um, time you sent a method inside a uh, uh, if each time you sent an array inside a method, all of its elements were copied every single time. That would take a lot of time. That's why these sort of objects, arrays and actually strings also, and string builders and scanners and a lot of other stif stuff we're going to be seeing more and more from here on out from in future lessons. All of that stuff, it doesn't get copied entirely. The only thing that gets copied is its address. So someone else gets the business card of that object and can visit it by looking at what the business card says. So when they visit the business card, they're visiting the actual object. 
So what you're passing around when you're passing in the race or other objects of that type, you're passing in a business card that has the address of the array. And when you go to that business card's address, well, you see that array. So that's the big difference between passing by value and passing by reference. Value types are located actually on the so-called program stack, whereas reference types are located on the so-called dynamic memory heap. And those uh, objects on the dynamic memory heap are pointed to by objects from the stack of values of value types. So when you have an object, let's say this is an int array, int array, that's actually just a stack variable which points to the actual object in memory. That's why I said that this this array isn't the actual object. It's an address of that actual object. The actual object is over here, this new int thing which we've initialized. So you have as many objects as you've seen the keyword new. If you have if you've seen the keyword new once, like here, and you have one array and then another array in a the method, then probably both of these arrays are actually not copies of the array, not probably, but exactly. These arrays are not copies of the array, but they both point to the same array. They're just addresses of that array. Okay, so so if, it, if that seems a bit cryptic for you, don't worry, all you need to understand is that primitive types, for now though, you, when we're talking more and more about objects, you need to uh, get used to this concept of reference and value types and how they are stored in memory. But for now, it's enough for you to uh, imagine that integer types, integers, chars, booleans, floats, doubles, and so on, are just copied. You just get a copy in the method. Whereas uh, arrays or strings or scanners or whatever are passed by reference, meaning that whatever this method does, it does to the original object. So accessing elements of the object modifies the object itself. So that's what a reference and a value type are. And we have these examples which I just showed you, what happens when you pass in an uh, integer number to a function, and what happens when you pass in, well, well in this situation, what's going to happen? We have a number five and we try to increment it with 15. And what's, what happens is that this number over here is just a copy of this number five over here and you modify the copy. Whereas if you get an array and pass that array in, what happens is that you're modifying the array itself, which is this array. Well, here's the array. This is the object itself. Here's one way of accessing that array, but here's another way of accessing that same array because why is it the same array? Well, because it's been passed in as a parameter and this parameter arrives by a reference. So this value type is addressed by the numbers reference. And since only one object exists, both of these point to that same object because no other objects have been created. The only thing that has been created is a new pointer to that object, a new reference to that object. So editing items inside that object will change the original object. Okay, so that's all you need to remember. Value types get copied uh, and Reference type, value type objects get copied. Reference type objects get only their business cards copied and whoever accesses whatever's on the business card accesses the original object itself. Okay, so let's continue on to the last parts of our lecture for today, our lesson for today, which is going to be how we can overload methods. Now what is overloading and what uh, is a method signature is something we'll explain now and then we'll continue on with examples. So. A method signature is the part of the method which can be, uh, w which is obvious from where you call the method. So when I go to the code which I had over here, which is, uh, which increments a number, or okay, let's go back to the power, that's a bit more interesting. So if I have a method power, and if I call that method power with the number 3.5 and the power, let's say, three, so this would raise the number 3.5 to the third power, and I assign it a value, and x equals that value. Oops, it's actually not an integer, it's double. Never mind, so when I'm calling this method, and actually if I ignore the setter, uh, the, the, the getting of the value and setting it to a variable, 
when I'm, when I'm calling this method, what happens is the uh, Java compiler looks at what parameters I'm supplying to this method and decides based on the parameters I'm supplying, which version of this method should be called. Now, what do you mean by version of a method? Well, we'll see it in a bit. So when you say uh, raise this number to the third power, what Java actually sees is the power method has been called and it's been called with a double parameter and an integer parameter. That's all Java sees. It doesn't really care about the values you're supplying it. At least that's what the Java compiler cares about during execution. Of course, the runtime cares about the actual values. But during compilation, what the compiler sees is just the name of the method and the parameter types of the method and the number of these parameters. Now, this thing over here, what you're seeing here, is called a method signature. The method signature is the combination of the method name and its parameter types, not its parameter names, but its parameter types and the number of those parameters. So if there are uh, three parameters, well, it's going to be a method with three parameters, meaning three data types for these parameters. So this is the method signature. And here, the method signature for print looks like so. Print accepting a string. Again, the compiler doesn't really care about your name the name of your variable. It only cares about the name of the method and the data types of the parameters. So, so that's a signature. Now, how does that matter to the concept of overloading methods and what, uh, what is that concept at all? Well, the signature is what differentiates between two methods with the same names. So actually, the signature is what differentiates between methods at all because it includes the method name as well. So the signature is actually the thing that distinguishes methods. So a method isn't simply its name, it's its name combined with its parameters. So two methods with the same name but different parameters are different methods from the point of view of the compiler. The compiler doesn't really think of the method print which accepts a string the same way as it thinks about the method print which accepts an integer. So it, for the compiler these are just two different methods. Now, if you have two methods with the same name and the same, the same data types for parameters, then you'd get a compilation error. The compiler will not allow you to have two different methods with the same signature because the signature needs to be unique. So when you have the same name for a method, but the signature is different, meaning that the data types are different, what, you're, what you get is the so-called overloading. This is a term in programming, which simply means that you have different versions of a method which accept different parameters. And if you go over here and check out the system.out.print method, you'd actually notice that it's not one print method, it's a lot of print methods, one of them accepting an integer, another accepting a boolean, another accepting a character, another accepting a long, another accepting a float. You get my point. They're, they are the same method name, but they have different parameters and they behave differently based on their parameters. So you can have the same method name with different parameters and that's what we call overloading. Okay, so the example the, the, the common example is exactly with the print function. If you receive an integer number, you call one print function. If you receive a double number, you call another print function. I will give you another example of overloading. Let's impl implement a get max function. What will that get max function do? Well, let's say it returns an integer number. Uh, it's a static method, it returns an integer number and it returns the maximum of two values, the value A and the value B. Okay, so the signature of this method is what? Well, the signature of this method is get max int comma int. So get max, which return which, which accepts two integer values. Okay, and what would uh, get max do? Well, if a is larger than b, it would return a. Otherwise, it would return b. By the way, do we need the else here? We don't. Why don't we need the else here? Because we can't reach this return value 
the, this, this return statement. We can't even reach this return statement if this was true. So if we get a true over here, we get into this condition and then immediately break the method, leave the method and never reach this return B. So when you have multiple returns inside the method, you can skip on, uh, you can cut corners by not doing else's like this. Uh, this else here is redundant because there is no way we can get to this code with a, if, if this code has executed. And that's the whole point of the else. The else ensures that you don't get into the uh, code block if the condition was true. But if the condition was true, there is no way we can reach this code block anyway because we're returning over here. So this is a get max method. It returns the maximum of two values. So if I say max equals get max from 4 and 70 and 82, the result will be 82 max will receive the va receive the value of 82 okay so this is what get max does now if i want to implement a get max which takes three elements so i want to be able to calculate the maximum of three elements not just two elements well i need another function static int get max again because it's doing the same thing so if a function if a method should do the same thing why not use the same name even though it accepts different parameters. So let's say this is A, B, and C. And immediately, what is the signature? What does the signature look like to the compiler? Well, it looks like get max, integer, integer, and yet another integer. So three integers, which is different than the signature of the get max with two integer parameters. Okay, so how would we implement this get max method? Well, I'd say int a b max equals get max of a and b and whatever the maximum of, of a and b is let's compare that with another get max with c so the maximum of the first two compared with c should give us the maximum of all of them right so either a is larger than b or b is larger than a the only one we need to compare with c is the larger one so we get the larger one of these two and then we say again, get max of the a, b max and c. So what I'm doing here is actually I'm, get, I'm having one method, which is an overload of another method, but I'm delegating back to the simpler version of the, of the method, which accepts two parameters. So that's a sort of a hack you can do with overloading methods. You can have the same method, which delegates to it's, it's not really itself. This is a different method. Don't be confused by the fact that they have the same name. The compiler doesn't see them as, as being the same method. Only we humans see them as being the same method, but these are actually completely different methods because they have completely different signatures. The same way humans have last names, right? So even though you have the same first name as someone, it doesn't mean you're the same person because you have a different last name. And here it's the same thing. Well, sure, they have a, the, the same first name, the method name, but they have a different last name, the method signature. Uh, the, actually, the method parameter types, the signature is the whole thing. The signature is the full name. Okay, so this is one uh, utility of overloading. You uh, implement different behavior. The get max of three values is very different behavior than the get max of two values, but it essentially does the same job. So uh, overloading is, is a concept used so that essentially the same operations, the same, the same effect on the output of your program is achieved with methods of the same name, but which accept different parameters and may use those parameters in different ways. Okay, so that's typi typically what overloading is. It's just the option to have the same name of a method which accepts different parameters due to the fact that the different parameters actually supply you with a different signature which the compiler sees as an entirely different method okay and here's another example of this print method one version which accepts as accepts an integer another which accepts a string and another which accepts a, a string and an integer and does something completely different with them so this is again a completely valid overload of a method okay so the methods return type, something you need to keep in mind, is not part of the signature. Why isn't it a part of the signature? Because there's no way that I can write, uh, I can write get max just like this operation. Now, you might say, well, fine, can't the compiler see what I'm assigning it to? Well, 
not if I'm not assigning it. There are situations where I'm not going to be assigning it or I'm going to be assigning it to, to something which can be different values. So the return type is not a part of the signature. If you have a void print method and a string print method, those two, and in, if they have the same uh, parameter types, those two are not different methods from the point of view of the compiler and this code will not compile. So the return type does not affect the signature of a method. Keep that in mind. Okay, so I already implemented the get max uh, method for you, so we'll skip over this uh, function. The only thing you need to do is implement it for different data types, implement it for a character, implement it for a string, implement it for an integer, and so on. You can compare strings and integers, the, uh, strings the same way you compare integers, so the code is going to be basically the same, but you're going to allow that method to be called with different value types, thanks to overloading it with different parameter types. Okay, and now once we've talked about what overloading is, and once we've seen a few examples, let's talk about how programs get executed. Okay, so I kind of showed that to you in one of the first lessons where we were talking about the debugger. Let's look at one of the things we were doing here, and I'll delete everything else because we don't... Actually, I won't delete anything. Why, why should we delete anything? It might be useful when we get to the point of naming methods because we have to go back to that to uh, cover again why we name certain methods in certain ways. Okay, so let's get back to this uh, print increasing sequence method and the print triangle method. So let's go into the main method and um, do the scanner initialization, then do the scanner input, so read the next integer from the scanner. We're solving again the task with the triangles. So Let's read the next integer from the scanner and say this is the width of the triangle. And now let's call the print triangle method with the width over here. And now let's start the debugger and see what happens with our program. Now, the way computers organize code that's executing, the way um, Java code is structured into the executable memory of a computer and how other languages are uh, structured into that memory too, is the following. Each time you go into a method, that method gets pushed into the current program stack. These frames over here in the debugger in IntelliJ are the so-called program stack. What's a stack? Well, you've probably washed dishes in some part of your life before. So dishes ordered on top of each other are a stack. The only way you can safely take uh, one of the plates from here is by taking the top plate. You can't take the bottom plate because everything else will fall apart. So you push onto the top of this stack. So you go home, you decide you want to eat, you eat uh, one plate of something, then you eat another plate of something, and then you eat another plate of something, and then you eat another plate of something. And let's say at some point you reach to eating the dessert. And when you go to wash the dishes, you first have to wash the plate with the dessert. This is the dessert plate, dessert plate. You first need to wash the dessert plate. Why? Because that's the last plate you pushed onto that stack of plates. And once you've washed the dessert plate, then you can wash the main course plate, for example, and so on. So uh, that's, of course, assuming that you eat dessert after everything else, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. So the last thing you put into a stack is the first thing you can pop out of that stack. And that's actually the terminology. It's pushing into a stack and popping out of a stack. So this, this adds items, whereas this removes items. Popping items removes those items from the top of the stack. Now, why is the stack important? Because notice what's going to happen here. So we're going into the main method. So what happens in the so-called program stack in uh, computer science is that the main method comes over here and becomes the first item in the program stack and it stays there along with all it, all of its variables for example this arcs vari variable and the scanner variable and this width variable and so on so main is the first thing on the stack then it calls scanner.nextInt and scanner.nextInt gets placed on the stack so next int gets placed on the stack Next int executes, 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 and at some point it returns a value. 
it returns that value to main. And when it returns that value and assigns that value to, in this case, the width variable, this thing gets popped out of the stack, meaning this thing gets removed from the stack and width now has a value, for example, five. Okay, and now when I say print triangle, print triangle arrives on this stack, on top of this stack. Okay, so print triangle gets executed and it accepts that width parameter. And print triangle on its uh, hand, on its turn, starts executing for loops, which call what? They call the print increasing sequence, uh, sequence, print increasing sequence method. And that executes once, and then it gets removed from the stack. And then it gets added again, and then it gets removed because it's in a for loop. And then it gets added again, and then removed, and added again, and removed, and added again, and removed, and so on and so forth, until the print triangle method stops calling the um, print increasing sequence method. And when the print triangle method finishes its execution, it gets popped out of the stack, and we arrive over here at the end of the print triangle call. So when this in invocation ends, all of the stack information for this print triangle gets popped out of the stack. And when that ends, since we're re reaching the end of the main program as well, when we get to that point, the main program will get popped out of the stack and removed. And when that main method gets popped out of the stack, the program ends its ex execution. This is how code gets ordered when you're calling methods. They, you get methods on top of methods on top of methods on top of methods. And only the topmost method gets executed. And when that one gets executed, the next one below it continues its execution. So that's the program stack and we can now see how that happens. So currently we're in the main method and you can see that on the stack. Okay, so now if we navigate into this next int method and place a breakpoint, place a breakpoint over here and press F9, notice how now in the program stack in the frames we have main and on top of it we have next int, which means that next int needs to finish its execution before main can continue for, from wherever it was uh, it left its uh, control to next int. So here, main leaves the control to next int. It, it delegates the control of the program to next int. And until next int gets executed, main will not continue. It will stay at this part of the code until next int completes its functioning. Now, when it does, this next int method will get popped out of the stack and only main will remain. So pressing F9 again. Uh, of course, nothing is happening currently because we're waiting for the, for the input for next int. So let's enter, for example, 4. And now, if we go back to the debugger, we can see that only main remains because scanner.nextInt completed its execution. Okay, and now we have print triangle. And if we put a breakpoint over here and press F9, we'll notice that print triangle appears on top of main. And this means that print triangle needs to execute fully because before we can return to main. Okay, so now going into this for loop, we're still on the print triangle method. But the moment we call the print increasing sequence method and get into that one, we're going to get that one added on top of the stack. So notice that how we're over here and on top of the stack, we have the print increasing sequence method, which is now finishing up because I placed the breakpoint at the end of that method. And if I want to see where and at which part of the code I got to navigate into the print increasing sequence, well, I can click on this stack trace over here. This is called a stack trace. Well, it's actually called a stack. It's called a stack trace if you see an error, which describes uh, line by line in which method what thing failed. Okay, so print increasing sequence in it were here, but that was called from over here. Okay, so if I press F9 again, since I'm in print increasing sequence, that will leave the print increasing sequence method and return to this to the next call of print increasing sequence. So this will get popped out of the stack. We will get back to print triangle being on top of the stack. It will execute the next iteration in the for loop and then it will pop up the, uh, it will push in the print increasing sequence on, on the stack again. So we're seeing that in action now. I just 
left the print increasing sequence method. And now I'm on the next iteration of the loop. Notice that i is now 2. Okay. And now I'm going to push this print increasing sequence method back onto the stack. So pressing F9 now, we're back inside the print increasing sequence method. And now we can notice that the print increasing sequence is back on the stack. And now we can let this continue on uh, until it completes. And wherever this method completes its execution, meaning that when we get to this point at the end of the method's uh, body, print increasing sequence will, let's remove this breakpoint, print increasing sequence will no longer get added on top of the stack because we just asked IntelliJ to navigate to the next breakpoint, which is outside of, which is at the end of this method, meaning that all of the calls to print increasing sequence have been already done. Now print increasing sequence won't be added anymore and even print triangle will be leaving the stack because we're reaching the end of its body. And when we reach the end of its body, we will pop that out of the stack and reach the end of the body of the main, uh, main method. So here we are at the end of the body of the main method and notice how the main method is the last thing on the stack and after this uh, breakpoint continues forward. After we continue forward from this breakpoint, the next step will be for the main uh, method to be popped out of the stack and for the program to finish its execution. So that's how the program stack works, and that's how you can navigate with the debugger through that program stack to check the values of variables at each of those states. Each of the times I paused somewhere in the program stack and navigated up and down on that program stack, I could have examined the variables on that program stack. I even showed you, for example, the i variable and its change in value. So that's how the pro that's how programs encoding can execute and we have more examples over here and let's see an, an, an animation of how that programming stack works so if you have main and that calls method a and that calls method b then main will go onto the stack and then method a will cover main over the stack and then that will call method b and that will put method B on the stack. And when method B completes its execution, it will be removed from the stack. And then when method A completes its execution, it will be removed from the stack. And then only main will, will remain. Let's see that. So we start by pushing, putting main onto the call stack. Then main, if main calls method A, method A gets pushed into the call stack. And then if that one calls method B, that one gets pushed onto the call stack. Now when method B returns, it gets removed from the call stack and control is returned to method A, meaning that program execution continues from where method A left off. And then when method A completes, program execution continues from where, where the main method left off, uh, where it called method A. And when it completes its execution, it gets removed from the stack and the po program finishes its execution. So that's what the call stack is and it's important for you to have an, a visual idea of how it looks like because it really helps with debugging and figuring out which part of your code executed after what. Okay, so we have another task over here and since it's really similar to what we've already, uh, already solved in previous lessons, we have a number and we should split that number into evens and odds. So we should start dividing that number and getting the last digit of that number. And if the digit is positive, we need to add it into um, a positive, uh, uh, into an, so if the digit is even or non, -e or even or odd, we need to uh, multiply in the appropriate multiplication, uh, in the appropriate product. So we'll have a product for all the even numbers and a product for all the um, odd numbers inside this value of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what do we need to do? Well, we just need to pop out the last element from here, check, its, uh, check whether it's even or odd, and then multiply it into the appropriate product. So since we've already done separating values, uh, separating a number into its component values, and since we've already done something similar with calculating the even sum of an array, this is pretty much the same as doing an even sum of an array, even and odd sums of an array. But instead of iterating through an array, we're doing it over the digits of a number, which we've already done. And instead of 
doing sum or doing a multiplication. And that's all which we need to be doing over here. So you can try solving this problem by yourself by using the uh, things we saw in previous examples. And before we go on to the, to the summary of this lesson, let's go back to the naming conventions which we should be following. So what I mentioned earlier was that I was going to go back to the naming conventions and best practices for when we're writing methods after we know what methods are and how they are organized and how their program stack works. So here are your guidelines for how you should be writing your methods once you know, once you now know what they are. So the most important thing you're going to be doing is giving meaningful names. Now notice how I have been naming my methods. Print triangle. Now this might not be obvious if you don't know the task it's solving, but within the context of the task, print triangle is a clear enough name which describes what this method will be doing. Inside it, we have a more generic method, which is print increasing sequence. Now, the moment you see the print increasing sequence, you will probably notice that this is a method I can be using in a lot of other places in addition to using it inside the print triangle method. So that's why I'm naming it so generally. Print increasing sequence is something I can call from pretty much anywhere where I need to have an increasing sequence of numbers. Whereas the triangle is very specific for the task at hand. So since it's very specific, I'm giving it a very specific name, which is not very useful outside of the context of the task. But print increasing sequence is valid in any case. It doesn't matter what program you're writing, print increasing sequence is pr pretty clear on what it actually does. So try for names like this uh, uh, more, more often than names like print triangle. But if you have uh, a context specific uh, method, that's also okay. So this is okay, but this print increasing sequence name is better for more general reuse. For non-general reuse, for single use purposes inside a single program with a specific aim, it's okay to have a more non-general name. Okay, uh, what else do you need to know about method naming? So meaningful names and your name should ask, answer the question, what does this method do? It should contain some sort of verb, some sort of action being executed. So whenever I read a method, I should know that this does this operation. For example, system.out.println, print line, tells me that there's going to be printing involved. So I know this method is printing. Um, now you could use non-verbal, uh, non-verb non method names. For example, the math libraries have a lot of those like cosine, uh, absolute, max, and so on. But that pretty much only applies for mathematical functions or something very, domain specific, something very specific for the task you're solving. So try to use uh, verbs in the names of your methods. Now, if you can't find a good name for a method, that probably means that your method isn't supposed to be a single method. If it's doing five things at once and you can't name it uh, in, with a pretty short name, well, it, it probably means that you need several methods to do those five things, se several separate methods. So a method should do one thing. It shouldn't do several different things. And the reason for, for that, you're, you're probably thinking, okay, isn't it better if a method dis does a lot of things? Well, it's only better for the situation you're using it in currently. So for the exact specific place you're calling it. Yeah, it's better because it shortens your code, but it's actually not better because you can't reuse it. If it does a lot of things and you need uh, to reuse some of those things somewhere else, well, you can't do that if it's a single method. Whereas if there are, for example, if your method does five things, if there are methods for each of those five things, then you can recombine the uses of these five things in any way you wish. You can use, for example, the first two things or the first and the last or the, the middle three or whatever combination you actually need to uh, do to execute your code. Like it's a bit like our print triangle method. So print triangle actually does a few things, but it's also subdivided into smaller methods, print increasing sequence, uh, which can be reused anywhere. So 
Even if I don't reuse print triangle, I can always reuse print increasing sequence, which is the more generic method. So the more generic you make a method, the easier it will be to reuse. Now, that's not always the aim, but it's more often than not the aim. Okay, so parameters should, first of all, complement the method name. So you don't need to, um, for example, this parameter last is clear enough in the print increasing sequence contest context. You don't need to name it last number in increasing sequence because the method al already says that. And just saying last, well, obviously it's going to be the last number in the increasing sequence. What else is going to is it going to be the last of? So don't overdo it with naming the parameters. Name the parameters in such a way that they are clear uh, when you after you read the method name and then you read the parameter, you understand what that parameter will mean for that method. Now you should use camel case just like you're using for variable names. That's pretty standard, so it's not really weird. P basically, parameter names should follow the same rules as variable names. But in addition to that, you should think about the method name and you should avoid repeating words from the method name unless you unless it really is necessary. And again, they should be meaningful. Uh, another good thing to keep in mind about parameters is that if you're using non-standard unit systems or if you have a project in which it's not clear what unit systems you're using, you should probably supply the unit names for that parameter. So if you're supplying speed in kilometers per hour instead of meters per second, for example, which is the uh, interna international physical standard for measuring speed, uh, if you're measuring speed in kilometers per hour, you should probably mention that in your variable name uh, at the end to just indicate in what unit you're expecting the values to be. And font size in pixels is also a good name because it indicates that, you're wa that you want to measure the font size in pixels, not, for example, in percentages or in M's or in, um, or, or in some other weird unit. Okay, so your names should be meaningful and they should sometimes uh, mention the units which they are using if they are using some type of unit. Okay, uh, what else? Avoid stuff like uh, underscores and capital letters on the first uh, word of the variable, just like you would do, just like you would do for variables. So, so these rules are pretty much the same. Now, as I said, methods should do one thing. They shouldn't do three things at once, especially they shouldn't do three different things. My getMax method gets the maximum value of two values. It doesn't also print that on the console. There are other methods which print. So I have a single getMax method and then I can decide what I can do with that getMax method. Whereas if my getMax method instead printed a value on the console, I wouldn't be able to use that value for calculations. I would only be able to print it on the console. So methods should try to do one thing. If they can, they should try to do one thing and there should be another method which uses their return value as a parameter and for example prints that to the console. So uh, another thing you should avoid is very long methods. Now, what does method longer than a long screen, longer than one screen mean? Screens are different these days. Um, it, it's not back to the old days where all screens were the same. Uh, it, every screen is different and special these days. Well, what does one screen mean? It depends on the team you're working with. Most of the time when you're coding, you're, you will be working with a team and you will probably have a standard definition of what's the acceptable length of a method. It's typically 40, 50 lines of code, but it really depends on the team. It really depends on your screen. It really depends um, on you personally. So the point is follow some sort of convention. While you're a student and you're still studying, well, get your uh, screen size and kind of try to have your method shorter than, shorter than your screen size so that one method doesn't fill up your entire screen. And if it starts filling it up, well, extract more methods from it. If you have that much code inside a method, think about can't I get this piece of code and move it into another method which I can just call from my method. The same way you extract code from main into methods, you can extract code from other methods into other methods. You don't need to only extract code from main. 
Okay, so this print receipt method in this case can have a print header, print body and print footer methods which it calls. And this is also safe self-documenting because once you see the print receipt method, you don't need to wonder how it works. You just need to know, okay, so semantically this thing prints a header, then prints a body, then prints a footer. If I care about what these consist of, I'll go navigate to the method definition and see that. By the way, if you nav if you go to, I've told you this before, but let's repeat. If you put your cursor on a, on a method and you press control B, that will navigate you to the method definition. So, or you can right click and press go to definition. Okay, how do you format code? Well, the same way, how do you format method code? The same way that main is formatted. So you, for, you follow the code standards of main. It's pretty similar to what you would do for for loops and while loops and, and so on, with the difference that instead of a for loop, you have the static, the void and the method name or the static and the method return type followed by the method name and then the parameters. Now, in Java, it's standard for the method name to be uh, glued together to the brackets and the arguments to also be glued together to the brackets. But again, check out how the, how the uh, main method is structured and structure your, your code like that. Now, very important, use correct indentation. I, and if you don't know what the correct indentation is, input your method and then use Control alt l to reformat your code with IntelliJ so that your code gets formatted with proper indentation. Indentation is actually pretty important because humans are visual creatures and it's much easier for us to detect what uh, what parts of a code do what when we have indent indented, when we have these parts of code indented in a way that uh, makes them stand out as part of that code block. So indentation is pretty important. Use Control alt l to format your code. Now, if you're, you're writing multiple methods, try to leave blank lines between them. Not just per try, just do it, do it. Leave blank lines between methods. Okay, and same goes for loops and if statements. And sometimes you would like blank lines for from different pieces of code where you indicate that this is a part of code which does something, then there's another part of code which does something else and so on. Okay, so... Another thing you should try to do is avoid long lines and complex expressions. What do we mean by that? Well, if you have a if you have a very long line in a method, shouldn't that be a variable or maybe another method call? Think about that. Don't don't have very long lines that are as wide as your screen or even up to 70% of your screen gets like too much. Okay, so that's some advice for code structure and formatting. Now I know that all of these things will take time for you to uh, create into habits, but that's why we're telling you these things early on. You won't uh, hit everything spot on the first time you're trying to write code, but every time you write some methods, go over these namings and best practices. That's why they're so uh, so much in the start of the lecture. That's why we've placed these slides over here, even though semantically we should be talking about them at the end of the lecture, like I'm doing now. So. When you've written some part of some piece of code and you're happy with it and it works, go over these uh, conventions and see if you're meeting them correctly. And if you're not, think about how you can restructure your code so you can follow these conventions better and these best practices. Okay, so what did we talk about today? We talked about how we can split large programs into small, easily testable, easily understandable pieces of code called methods. And we said that these methods contain contains declarations, signatures, and bodies, and we call them using their name and their parameters. If they have parameters, if no, if they don't have parameters, we just leave the brackets empty. We also uh, said that these methods can return values, and if they don't return values, we mark them as void. And we also said that when a method returns a value, it immediately breaks its execution, meaning it stops its execution and returns the control of the program to whoever called that method. And we talked about how we can trace the execution of a program and what the program stack is and how we can see that in the debugger. And I hope this was useful for you. I hope you learned something new and I hope you can now use this newfound knowledge to organize your code better and to write it faster even. 
And of course, if you have any questions on anything we've discussed today, please ask them in all the channels we've supplied for asking questions about the lectures. Uh, happy to have uh, done this uh, lesson to you. Uh, to done this lesson. Yeah, I, yeah, I definitely did this to you, didn't I? So uh, I'm really happy that I could uh, teach you this concept of methods. It's a very important concept in programming. I hope it was useful for you and I will see you next time. Did you like this lesson? Do you want more? Join the Werner's community at softuni.org. Subscribe to my YouTube channel to get more free video tutorials on coding and software development. Get free access to the practical exercises and the automated judge system for this coding lesson and many others. Get free help from mentors and meet other learners. Join now, it's free. Softuni.org